once upon a time there was a war. It all began as a single spark caused by the call for independence of one colony. And because of this one spark, all of Earth and her colonies would be set ablaze in a conflict known as the Seventh Space War. After eight months of deadly stalemate, both the Space Revolutionary Army and the United Nations Earth would unveil their respective aces determined to break the deadlock. The Space Revolutionary Army threatened to drop an innumerable amount of colonies onto the Earth in an attempt to get the United Nations Earth to accept their demands and surrender. The UNE, on the other hand, was determined to keep fighting until the bitter end and would bet everything they had on their brand new mobile suits called Gundams. There was the Heavy Assault GT9600 Leopard Gundam, the High Speed Transformable GW9800 Gundam Airmaster, and the most deadly of the three, the GX9900 Gundam X, the subject of this video, sometimes also referred to as just the GX. And what made this GX so deadly was the combination of two distinct features. The first one being its main weapon, the satellite cannon. Although it might be more accurate to say that the Gundam X was the mobile suit that was mounted to the weapon rather than the other way around. Because a lot of the Gundam X's features were made to support it and its overwhelming power. This beam cannon had enough output to destroy a space colony in a single shot and when fully charged, it could fire two to three of these shots. But for fighting against mobile suits, it could also fire less powerful beams. What made it even deadlier then is that a system was developed to instantly resupply the GX called the Super Microwave. The facility for this was housed on the moon and thanks to a series of relay satellites, the GX could be resupplied no matter where it was. This microwave would then be caught by the green section on its chest and the energy would be stored in various conductors all over its body. Then when the cannon was preparing to fire, the reflector blades on its back were deployed to concentrate this energy and turn it into pure destructive power. But this wasn't the only use for that energy. The reflector blades could also emit that energy by themselves, turning it into an alternate form of thrust. And then by changing the angle of these blades, this thrust could be controlled just like a conventional thruster. And when used like this, it was called the hovering mode. The other use of this energy then was of course powering the other weapons that the GX had access to, which we'll cover in a second. But it was said that when fully charged, the mobile suit could fight on for a week, and the satellite cannon used all of this energy up in mere seconds. That really says something about its awesome power. But do you know what's better than one super-powered beam cannon? Multiple super-powered beam cannons. And that is where the GX's second main feature came into play, the flash system. A special combat system for new type pilots that was used in two ways on the GX. First, a new type pilot needed to use that flash system to register their unit's satellite system with that aforementioned lunar base and its super microwave system. However, once it was registered, any other regular pilot could also use it. And secondly, it was used to control the GX bits. Simply put, these were remote controlled and simplified versions of the GX, but their weapons remained largely the same. A large beam sword, a shield buster rifle, and of course, the satellite cannon. And to really make this system a blast, one GX 
could control up to 12 GX bits, exponentially increasing the destruction that a single new type pilot was capable of. However, even without its satellite cannon and GX bits, the GX was no pushover. Its standard weapons consisted of four chest-mounted breast Vulcans, a high-output large beam sword which had a wide blade that could easily cut an enemy mobile suit in half, and the very unique looking shield buster rifle. Its output is three times higher than that of a regular beam rifle, and as its name indicates, the armored flaps on its sides can fold up to turn it into a small shield. And additionally, it could also be outfitted with a shoulder-mounted four-barreled Vulcan gun. Originally, it was believed that three units were made. Unit 1 was used by Jamil Neat in the final battle of the Seventh Space War and got badly damaged. Unit 2 was kept in storage on Earth and was never used during the Seventh Space War. And all we know about Unit 3 is that it got destroyed. Unfortunately though, neither the GX nor its sister units were able to stop the Space Revolutionary Army and their colony drop. For every colony they managed to take out, another one made it past them and was dropped onto Earth, completely devastating it. There would be no Merry Xmas that year. But maybe you can have one by gifting yourself or a friend something from Evex Creation's official Gundam Seed collaboration. They've got a lot of things like all kinds of backpacks, bags, power banks and much more themed after the main Gundam Seed Gundams. The Freedom, the Justice and the Strike. And they're all done in a style where the design doesn't scream anime, but for anyone who knows the series, it is immediately obvious what you're using. And let's start by having a look at the smallest thing they sent over, which also has the flashiest design of the bunch, the card case. It's got a clip on the back for cash and can easily hold up to 15 different cards. So in go my Banna Passport, Konami E-Amusement Pass, Gundam Base card, these 9 cards I got at Comiket once, this other card I got at Comiket once, this Evangelion Wafer card, and my important cards that I'm not showing for obvious reasons. And this wallet won't let what happened to the Freedom happen to your information. Thanks to RFID protection, nobody will be able to get access to your credit cards or your passport. And we can store this little thing and so much more in the AGS Pro suspension backpack and it's 24.4 liters of storage. It's got so many compartments to store just about anything and it's also built to hold them. Not only does it have a padded back, but it's also got their signature AGS suspension system. This system uses a spring to absorb the shocks from walking to better protect your muscles and your spine. It's like movable frame technology, but to protect your back. And on top of that, it is water repellent and it's got a little bit of extra bling too. Everything to head out and steal a top secret Gundam. Or, you know, grab the train. What also has a lot of compartments then, but doesn't look like it, is the crossbody bag. There's the front compartment, in goes the Goblin Slayer light novel, a hidden front compartment, expandable main storage, giving me more than enough room to store my Vita, big power bank and sunglasses, an extra padded compartment for a tablet, in goes the Advance of Zeta manga, there's a small bottle holder and it is also water repellent. Perfect for a quick mission. And then finally, we have this sturdy Blueprint-esque Freedom Gundam mouse pad that will last you as long as the Freedom's nuclear reactor. So if you need some more freedom in your life, you can get these items with the link in the description down below and the top comment. And by using the code Kakarot, you'll also get 10% off on any items you get. Meanwhile in Gundam X then, despite the Earth being completely devastated, humanity did find a way to survive, just like the remaining GXs did. The first one that would be uncovered was Unit 2, 
by Garrett or Garrod Ron, a young scavenger slash mercenary who mostly made a living capturing and selling mobile suits. And one day, he was hired to save a new type girl called Tifa from a bunch of evil vultures, which was the catch-all term in Gunamex for people who go around scavenging mobile suits, ships, bases, and whatever else was left over from the war in order to make a living. But this mission would turn out completely different than planned, because it turned out that the vultures were the good guys and his contractor was the evil one. And in the ensuing battle, he found Unit 2 and ended up inside of it along with Tifa. Now, because Unit 2 was the unused GX that was stuck in storage, it wasn't registered with the lunar base and therefore couldn't use its main weapon, the satellite system, therefore putting it at a disadvantage in combat. However, since Tifa was a new type, she could register the GX for him, allowing Garrett to finish the fight in a second. After this then, to make a very long story very short, Garrett and Tifa, along with Unit 2, joined the Vultures. And it was here that we would get our first GX variant, the Gundam X Divider. Now, because of the nature of their job, Vultures found a lot of really interesting things, including some very interesting weapons. Garrett initially wasn't too keen on having his GX overhauled, but after it got trashed in combat, he relented because he kinda had to, and allowed the genius mechanic, Kit Salsamil, to work his magic. Many parts on the GX were damaged, and especially the satellite system was completely foobar. But this was no problem for Kid. In fact, he was excited that he finally got to put his collection of various parts to use. And use them, he did. While he couldn't fix the devastating satellite cannon, he could increase the performance of the machine in just about every other area. The new backpack held two beam sabers instead of one, as well as powerful thrusters and two energy tanks each of which could power the Gundam for up to 12 hours. And also, by reusing the capacitors and amplifiers of the satellite cannon, it was possible for both beam sabers to have a very high output. And for its main handheld equipment, it got the Twin Beam Machine Gun, a beam rifle that was made out of mega particle cannons that were used by the battleships of the former UNE. Thanks to its double sensor, it had excellent accuracy, and it had two firing modes. Maximum output, where both barrels would fire simultaneously, or continuous firing mode, where the barrels would alternate their firing. And this alternating could be done so quickly that it was likened to a beam machine gun. Kit's crowning achievement for the upgraded Gundam X, though, was the divider a giant multifunctional shield. When handheld, it could either serve as a regular shield, or it could open up to reveal its arsenal of 19 beam cannons. There was one main cannon and six triple-barreled harmonicas, which were the Space Revolutionary Army's anti-mobile suit weapons, which in turn became the namesake for this new cannon the Harmonica Cannon, and when not in use, it could be stored on the backpack, where the mobile armor-grade thrusters would increase its already fantastic speed and mobility to even greater heights. And these thrusters could also be used when the shield was being handheld, if the situation required it. So, sufficient to say, this was an extremely versatile shield, and it became the defining feature of the overhauled Gundam X, which therefore became known as the Gundam X Divider. But it still had a few more tricks up its sleeve. 
It also got the Hyper Bazooka, which was a modified cannon from the Dodger's weapon, which could also fire torpedoes for underwater combat, and the X Grenadier, mobile suit sized grenades that were made from missile warheads. Two of these could be stored on a rack on the divider's left side skirt. And if that still wasn't enough, the flash system did remain intact. So when piloted by a new type, the G bits could still be used. And throughout its service life then, the divider would be overhauled two more times. The first time was when the divider switched pilots. At first, it was still piloted by Garrett, but when he switched over to the double X, which was another development of the Gundam X that we'll tackle in a second, Jamil Need took over the controls of the divider. But there was just one problem here. The Gundam X had a kind of safety system where instead of a key, a special joystick known as the G-Con or G-Controller needed to be inserted for the mobile suit to be operated. And both the divider and the double X needed this joystick. But there was only one controller for both mobile suits. So the divider had to get its cockpit overhauled in order to function without the G controller. The second time then was after the events of the eighth space war. The crew was able to locate enough spare parts to once again equip the GX with a satellite cannon and was now rechristened as Unit 3 for some reason. Because if you remember correctly, the divider was modified from Unit 2 whereas the original Unit 3 was destroyed. But regardless, this new Unit 3 had a performance that was roughly 30% higher of the original GX, and also kept some of the equipment from the divider, like the twin B machine gun and the hyper bazooka. And the final difference then was the color. For our next variant then, we go back to the damaged Unit 1 the unit that was originally piloted by Jamil during the Seventh Space War in service of the United Nations Earth. At some point after this calamity, the new United Nations Earth found a wreckage and began developing a successor unit, the Double X, sometimes also referred to as the DX. Now this unit was meant to signify the resurgence of the United Nations Earth to power and was therefore designed as the most powerful unit that they could with the resources they had, which is also the reason why they used Unit 1 as a base unit. They simply did not have the means to build a completely new state-of-the-art mobile suit. But despite its base being a then 15-year-old mobile suit, the DX would become the strongest machine around at the time of its rollout, with its main feature of course being a development of the satellite system, the Satellite System Mark II. And true to its name, it was quite literally double that of the one used by the original GX. It had two cannons and six large reflectors to fuel them something that gave the DX unprecedented firepower, which then in turn also required much stronger cooling systems. So to take care of this, the DX was outfitted with extra cooling plates on the arms and legs, and its head was also redesigned to maximize cooling. And another benefit of the Satellite System Mark II was that both cannons were locked in place by a special brace, instead of requiring the DX to hold on to them with its hands, meaning that they were free to hold and use other weapons while the cannons were charging and firing. And boy did the DX have a lot of handheld options. Its standard equipment consisted of a very simple Luna Titanium shield called the Defense Plate, two hyperbeam swords that had an output even higher than those of the GX, and a new Buster Rifle. Like the original, it is leagues ahead of standard issue beam rifles, but also very easy to maintain 
thanks to its simplified structure. But it also had access to things like a twin beam sword, which had beams on both sides of the handle, a beam javelin, a rocket launcher gun that was extremely powerful and could carry two extra warheads on its backskirt armor. But then the most devastating weapon of all was the G Hammer, a modern take on an old time favorite. The spiky ball was connected to a handle with a strong wire, and thanks to its thrusters, it could be fired at high velocity for maximum bonking power. But because of reasons, like the pilot being smart, this weapon was passed up in favor of the others. And to round up its incredible arsenal then, built into the mobile suit were two head-mounted Vulcan guns, two shoulder-mounted Gatling guns, two breast launchers that could be loaded with a variety of ammunition, and because it reused many parts of the original GX, it also had the flash system. So under no circumstances would you want a devastating machine like this to be stolen. And to make sure that this wouldn't happen, they again took inspiration from the original GX. They copied the system where you needed a special controller to activate the mobile suit. There was only one problem. They quite literally copied the system, meaning that the old G controller also still worked. And to make matters worse yet, because the flash system was taken from a GX that was already registered, any non-new type thief could also immediately use the twin satellite cannons. <laughs> They never learn. And that was all for the original three Gundam Xs that were believed to have existed. But seven years after the events of the Eighth Space War, a fourth unit would be discovered a black unit that was piloted by a new type only known as Kai. Other than the edgy color scheme though, it was initially the same as the other GXs. But also, just like the other GXs, it would see some modifications throughout its service life. In its first round of upgrades, it was outfitted with a more traditional looking holster shield and buster sheath rifle. Both were essentially larger versions of the shield and the rifle that made up the Buster Shield rifle, but were now made to be used separately. And when not in use, the rifle can still be stored inside of the shield. And on the back of that rifle, there's a beam sword, kinda similar to the setup of the satellite cannon. That thing, however, was removed because for some reason, Kai was able to use it, but its next pilot, Rick, got an error when he tried using it. So it basically became a very fancy paperweight. And as a finishing touch, the Gundam was repainted to be closer to its original heroic color scheme. Its second round of upgrades then consisted mainly of replacing the old parts with brand new ones to increase its overall performance, and further modifying its new weapons. The sheath rifle got an extra barrel and became the sheath rifle Kai, and the holster shield got a claw and became the Genion shield. And while those were all of the GX variants that we know about, so far, there is still one more machine that must be mentioned when we're talking about them. The G Falcon a Gundam support fighter that was developed by the UNE during the Seventh Space War. On its own, the unit was a powerful all-round fighter craft that managed to pack a serious punch with its built-in weapons. A pair of nose-mounted Vulcan guns, two 10-tube missile pods that fired infrared homing missiles, and two scattering beam cannons that were capable of destroying multiple mobile suits with a single shot. But of course, 
its main goal was to dock with the UNE's Gundams. The Leopard Gundam, Gundam Airmaster, and Gundam X. Ironically enough though, we don't know a lot about the G-Falcon from this time, and it would instead become famous for being used in combination with the Double X. And with that unit, it could be combined into two forms. The most simple one was the storage mode. By splitting into two halves, a storage compartment became available in which a mobile suit like the Double X or the original Gundam X could be inserted into and could then be ferried into battle or could undergo atmospheric re-entry on its own. After the Double X then entered combat, the G-Falcon could either act as a support fighter with its own arsenal or could combine into the second form, the combat form. The nose cone or the A parts would become additional chest armor and the rear section or the B parts would reinforce the double X's arsenal. Not only would the double X now have better mobility and more weapons, but the G Falcon also enhanced the output of the twin satellite cannon. Something that, by the way, was also the case in the aforementioned storage mode. So, despite this mode being called the storage mode, the DX's twin satellite cannons were still ready to fire at a moment's notice. As for the Airmaster and the Leopard Gundams then, we only know about one combination for each, and that is for their upgraded forms. The Air Master Burst can dock with the B parts in its transformed state, with the most important improvement here being the speed boost. It was already a very speedy machine, but it could now outclass high speed cruisers. The extra weapons were of course a very nice bonus too. And the Leopard Destroy would also only dock with the B parts. These would boost the performance of its own built-in weapons, as well as giving it even more weapons, and it now also gave this tank of a mobile suit atmospheric flight capabilities. And then last but not least, there was also a little known about prototype for the G Falcon, known as the G Falcon Delta. It seems to have functioned largely the same as the final production version, but had slightly different armor and also lacked the infrared homing missiles. And that has been all for the development history of the GX and the DX. Oh, and in case you're wondering where the names of the Gundam X and the Double X came from, for the standard Gundam X, the deployed reflector panels form a single X, and for the Double X, one X is formed by the undeployed reflector panels and the satellite cannons, and the other X is formed by the V-fin and the whiskers on its face. And then you can also kinda see a second set of Xs when the reflector panels are deployed, although they are kinda crooked, and in my opinion, they look way more like just two Ws. And that has been all for the development history of the GX and the DX. So don't forget to check out the official Gundam Seat and FX Creations collaboration with the links down below and the promo code Kakarot. As always, a big thank you to the Patreon supporters and I hope everyone watching has a Merry Gundam Xmas and Happy Holidays. I'll see you all again next time.